Hey guys, Nathan Chan here. Welcome back to another interview. It's March 27th. It's a Friday my time. It's a Thursday, March 26th for Josh uh, in the States, in California. Um, and we're in lockdown. So uh, we're trying to produce as much content as we can to help serve you guys during this really difficult and just uncertain time. I hope your family and I hope your friends and everyone is safe and healthy. And uh, we're trying to produce as much content as we can to help support. So uh, today we're joined by Josh Snow, who is the founder of a company called Snow Teeth Whitening. And uh, he's got an incredible journey to share. So I'm going to talk to him about like, you know, even the current times, I'm going to talk to him about his journey and everything he's doing now in this current climate and environment. And uh, yeah, look, Josh, thanks so much uh, for taking the time, man. Hey, it's my pleasure. I've been a big fan for a while. So it's uh, it's really cool to be chatting here with you today. It's interesting times, of course, but nevertheless, uh, I'm excited to share what I can here. Yeah, thank you, man. So look, um, first question I ask everyone is, is uh, how'd you get your job? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, really, I truly did stumble into what I, what I'm doing and, you know, entrepreneurship in general. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people, you have a similar story, so I won't harp on it too much, but I, growing up, I wanted to be a doctor cause I, I wanted to make enough money to help my family out. Um, I'm the youngest sibling in my family and, um, and my brothers, my brothers and sisters didn't have an opportunity to go to university. And so I just wanted to help out my family. Uh, I come from very modest means. Uh, so I was like, I want to be a doctor cause I want to make enough money help people. And I would like to be, you know, I would like to earn the respect inside of the community, like be able to do charitable work or community work. And like, I figured being a doctor kind of check those boxes off and it does. So I was just like, I got to be a doctor. Like I've got to figure this out. And, you know, I stumbled into entrepreneurship because times have got, times got a little bit tough for my family. And I was looking for ways to make money really just to buy my own stuff. Like I was, I was looking to, you know, buy my own underwear and socks. Like I, it wasn't like I was trying to, you know, at 13 years old, 14 years old, I wasn't thinking like, Oh, I want to buy a Lamborghini. It was like, at the time it was like, I don't want my parents to have to struggle or like, I don't, you know, I don't want to be a burden to them for asking for things for school or whatever it might be. And not that they made me feel that way. It was just in my head. And, uh, I started looking for jobs to see if I could, you know, work somewhere to make some money. And obviously nobody could hire me at the time because I was 13, 14 years old. And so I felt really stuck um, because nobody wanted to give me a job. I really wanted to help my family out. The economy started to kind of turn the other way in 2007, 2008. And um, yeah, I was stuck. And so I was looking for a job. And so the job I have today was invented or, or I discovered it through necessity, through struggle, adversity. And, uh, at the time I was, I was hanging out at the library. My family didn't have a computer at home even. So we didn't, you know, we didn't have internet or computer at home. So I was at the library and, uh, back in the day with your library card, uh, you could get about an hour of usage on the computer. And so you know, I was reading books at the time because you're around books and computers. That's about it, the library. And um, if I wasn't playing sports, I was at the library. So I uh, learned how to make websites. Um, I didn't know what I was doing at the time. I didn't know what I was learning at the time. I was reading these books because I was taking a uh, comprehension test, getting points for every book that I read. Those points I could cash in for like baseball tickets and soccer tickets and all that type of stuff. So I didn't know what I was doing. I was just, you know, reading books. And I found the hack that if I read the, the reference books, like the Four Dummies books, they were considered a 10 out of 10 points, um, but they had a lot of pictures in them. And so I was able to rack up a bunch of points by reading these Dummies books. And I had always been interested in computers, um, even though we didn't really have them growing up. I was always fascinated by them. So put two and two together. I started reading these How to Build Websites for Dummies books. And I said, wow, this seems like something I could actually do. So I started building my first you know, few little websites and blogs. And I, I didn't even know really what I was doing. But um, I just was putting stuff out there. And I was blown away that people started commenting and like from all over the world. I didn't know where they were at. And so that just like it, it blew my mind. I was like, whoa, 
And then once I found that I could make money from it, where I could make websites for other people and they would pay me to do that, that's when it all kind of clicked. And it happened for me at a very early age. Um, but that was what set the domino effect to today running multiple brands and doing what I do today. It was, you know, I want to help my family out. Can I make 500 bucks making a website for somebody? How can I be the best at making websites? And then it, you know, progressed from there. Yeah, I see. So, um, humble beginnings, talk to us kind of fast forward to now, how many brands do you, uh, own and operate? Uh, how many companies do you have? It sounds like you got like a lot going on, man. Yeah. So, um, I'm obviously known for snow. Um, Ed Snow's the, the internet's most popular oral care brand. Um, we've worked with, you know, all kinds of celebrities and all that. Um, and that brand has really taken off. I think there it's a refreshment in a dormant category, a very large category like oral care. It's, it's uh, traditionally very tough to break into an industry like that. I chose that market in that industry because, uh, I wanted the difficulty. Um, I had been going through some tough times again. So this was like, on. Um, it's funny how like you get these realizations through adversity and, and like speaking through the time we're going through right now with adversity, uh, you know, I think it gives you time to pause and think sometimes and kind of really prioritize what matters. And for me, I had sold my software company at 21 years old and, um, you know, I had, a, I had more money than I would ever imagine. Like I, I, to me, I was a billionaire in my head, right? I was like, oh my gosh, I made it. And so, you know, I went and bought the Lamborghini and the Bentley and, you know, I, I thought I was on top of the world. And I, I guess I was at the time. Um, I had finished university, top of my class, you know, uh, first in my family to finish and everything was great. But when I sold my company, you know, six months into it, I kind of felt like I didn't have a purpose anymore. I was like, okay, like this is like fun, like, but what am I going to do next? And whatever I do next has to be that much bigger than what I just did. But and there was just like all this pressure on me and most of it was in my head, I guess. But, um, I was looking for, you know, I was looking for things that I wanted to, uh, markets that I wanted to disrupt. And two of my buddies were creating a mattress company. It was the first bed in a box company, went on to become one of the largest, one of the top three in the world. Um, and I was like, okay, what markets am I going to look at? And so today, um, I own and operate primarily two businesses, one in uh, financial wellness, personal finances, uh, and the other in obviously oral care. Um, those are the two like main ones. Um, I've been fortunate to invest and advise lots of other brands, uh, a lot, which are no longer around today where, uh, like I said, when I sold my company, you know, I thought that I could buy my way to being an investor or something. And so I just started throwing money everywhere. $250,000 here, 200,000 here, 500,000 here. And you do that enough times and, uh, your pile of cash starts to disappear pretty quickly. And there's no callback on that capital. So I realized that if I was going to, one, I realized I wasn't rich enough to be able to give the way I wanted to give in the aspect of being an angel investor and investing in lots of businesses. And I felt that I was a little too restless too. I felt like I had to do something. I needed something to do. And I happened to be going through oral surgery at the time, jaw surgery. And that's what allowed me to stumble into the oral care markets. And personal finances has always been something that I've been fascinated by because coming from a, an upbringing where, you know, where we weren't wealthy by any means, you know, uh, I, I had to learn the hard way of letting people manage my money and stuff and getting screwed over. And so, uh, personal empowerment through personal finances or empowerment through, through personal finances is something I've always been passionate about because they don't teach enough about it in schools and university. So that kind of has always been a background, but I'm most passionate about those two businesses. That's where I spend the majority of my time. Yeah, I see. And, um, so what was your software company that you sold at 21? What was it? And what, 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 what did you do? So I was, I started when I was 13, 14, I, I started in program, uh, programming web development specifically, and then moved to design because, um, again, I didn't know what I was doing. It's like, Oh, I need to design it. Okay. I need to figure out Photoshop. Um, I can't afford Photoshop. How do I download a torrent of it? Because I can't afford it. And it's just like one thing led to the other. So I built essentially an agency. I didn't know what I was doing until I was 15 or 16 years old. Uh, made my first million dollars at 17 or somewhere around there. And, um, 
you kind of feel like there's this moment of like, oh, this parade, you know, all of a sudden breaks out. And in reality, it was in my head, but I was I wasn't even satisfied because it was like, okay, that means there's so much more potential. Uh, so to answer your question, what happened is between 17 years old and 21, I started to look at, you know, uh, this agency business. Could I sell this type of business? Like, you know, what am I doing here? You know, what's going on? Um, and I found that really what was unique about what we're doing was the software I had built kind of in the background to automate a lot of stuff because I knew that the agency work was kind of, uh, you know, very high maintenance, very high touch. And so I wanted to use my software and programming background, software development and programming background to try to automate or at least semi-automate a lot of the stuff in terms of media planning, uh, media distribution, particularly through media buying like Google Display Network. Um, and again, I didn't I didn't know a thing about anything I'm talking to you about. You know, I, everything I learned was from forums, you know, communities, uh, YouTube, Google, and books. But uh, you know, Google has has two sides of their platform, I mean, multiple sides, but they have their search where you go to google.com and then obviously the display side of things, which now includes YouTube. So the display is with those banner ads you see on every website. And so when a client would come over, let's say like um, Apple, let's say, and they're launching a new product, they say, okay, we wanna allocate $10 million to relevant websites that are talking about the iPhone or talking to our competitors. And we wanna place banner ads next to those blog posts so that we can grab the attention of a relevant article. Um, so essentially what my software would do is aggregate all of those websites that had Google Display Network on them um, and create banner ads that had a specific language based on that uh, article. So in simple terms, let's say you sell ice cream cones and you want you have a new ice cream flavor coming out, vanilla. You know, you're coming out with vanilla for the first time you want to spend a million bucks promoting this new vanilla ice cream. Well, everywhere that is talking about vanilla or ice cream or dessert or your competitors, you wanna be in front of, but if they're talking about vanilla in politics and they're saying that someone's vanilla, they're very plain and basic, you probably don't wanna show up there. So uh, the contextual, which means finding the words vanilla and showing an ad next to it, it's not always the most accurate form of advertising. So all I did was, and the reason why I came up with this was because I had overspent the client's budget like 40 or 50,000 bucks. It was bad, I just remember it was really bad. And um, it's because we had uh, the Google Display Network running, um, which is what we were getting known for, but some of the negative keywords, which means don't show me for this, um, you know, weren't enabled. So we ended up spending like an extra 40 or $50,000 of the client's money. And they had someone smart enough who was able to dig into it and had an idea of what happened. And it was really, it wasn't on purpose, but the negligence was on purpose. It was obviously our fault. We were paid to manage the money. So I was like, wow, like there's a fault in Google's algorithm where they're not always showing the most relevant stuff. It's kind of like if you're running a campaign right now with the coronavirus stuff going on, you have to be sensitive to what's going on and you don't want to seem, and hopefully you're not, but you certainly don't want to accidentally seem like you're profiting off of what's going on. So let's say you had an ad campaign running right now and it accidentally showed up and it made your company look like you were being insensitive to what's going on globally. That could hurt your brand. It can only waste your money, but it could hurt your brand big time. So there was a huge value to the software I had built to traditional PR agencies, traditional media companies, because they work with a lot of blue chip clients that couldn't afford to have that type of damage happen through Google Display Network. So that's a that's you know six years. Uh, I'm trying to condense into you know five ten minutes to explain as best as I can. But that software was valuable. At the end of the day, it was wasn't a very complex piece of software. If I'm being completely honest with you, it was I made it because I didn't want to lose clients' money anymore. And then I sold the shit out of it. And I sold it by saying, look, you can go to another agency, but they don't have the software we have. You might accidentally put an ad on a porn website and your brand could be ruined. It's up to you if you wanna take that risk. Or you can come with us, we have perfect reviews, you can talk to all our clients, we work with the best people. So I used it as a sales tool. And then as we started working with PR companies, they were reselling our services. So they would have like Nike, Kraft, whatever. I couldn't get those clients myself but they already had those clients, but they would say, 
Josh, you guys do all the you know digital media buying. We'll just mark it up. We'll give you 10% of the ad spend. We'll take 30%. I'm like, okay, sounds good. Well, I ended up signing that software. I piecemealed that software to those exact resellers because it was much more valuable for them to have versus their competitor have. So it's important to break that down because that's like six years of you know strategy and kind of figuring stuff out is I took a uh, agency service side business, built a piece of software kind of you know on accident, I guess, and then leaned into that software as our unique differentiator to charge more than everybody else and to keep our clients longer by scaring them in a sense. And then using that piece of software to go and sell to the people who were reselling our services and say, hey, either you're going to get it or your competitor is going to get it. Only one of you is going to get it. So I had to really like finesse that deal because I was working 16 hours a week, seven days a week, or 16 hours a day, seven days a week. I had gained like 80 pounds um, running that business. I was working a lot. I'm in charge of a lot of people's money. Uh, you know, I had an expensive office, lots of employees. Like it was, it was really, really hard. And I don't know if, if, if I didn't sell that business, it would have been really tough for me to keep going. And once I sold that business, six months later, I went through kind of a burnout and depression. Um, but that's, you know, from 13 years old to not knowing what I'm doing to 21 years old, multimillionaire and to depression slash burnout, a delayed burnout to kind of now where I'm at now. It's been, lots been going on. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Crazy. So, um, you started snow and, and, uh, like how long have you been running it? Cause you, yeah, when we spoke offline, it's okay to share, right? You guys are like a nine figure business annual right. revenue, right? Yeah. Snow started actually. So the first like inkling of snow started probably where we at? maybe six years ago. Uh, so like a while ago, that was the first inkling of it, of like, like, you know, I bought the domain name, kind of thought about it. I remember at the time I had a business part of another business and I wrote on the white, this, these big whiteboards I, I, in our office, I wrote down what I thought snow could be. And, um, uh, I had always been fascinated in beauty and a lot of our clients were in beauty and cosmetics and makeup, et cetera. And so I had this like personal fascination with fashion and beauty products, cosmetics. So I wrote this out. My partner was a little bit more software like, you know, like very business to business, very software focused. So when I wrote this whole thing out, he was like, it sounds cool, but I didn't really feel him like jive with it all the way. And so I kind of just said, all right, well, I'm going to buy the domain name and you know, we'll see what happens. I don't know. So I bought the domain name. I just put it aside because I felt not embarrassed, but I just didn't feel the energy coming from him about the idea. So I was like, screw it. Well, then, you know, fast forward two years past that, this is about four or five years ago now, I have jaw surgery, take out my jaw from my head, put it back in my head. I'm sitting there, you know, healing. And I'm looking at all the products I bought and I'm like, gosh, they're so ugly. Like all these products are ugly. Like, I would never post any of this stuff on Instagram. And I was like, why can't oral care be exciting? Why can't there be exciting flavors, exciting ingredients, collaborations, celebrities. Like, why is it not here? Everybody has teeth as far as I know. And I'm like, why is there not excitement in this industry? And as I was recovering from, from oral surgery, I had my jaw closed for two weeks. You know, I'm sitting there researching. And then I hit up my dentist, my orthodontist, and my oral surgeon. And I say, hey, will you guys help me, like, connect me to people? Like, I want to get in initially the teeth whitening space because teeth whitening was the only thing I could do without being a dentist or whatever, like any procedure. So uh, they're like, yeah, we'll help you out. I had been helping them out with business and stuff and connecting them. They're just good friends by that time. And they're like, yeah, we'll help you out. We'll connect you to who we can. Um, and that's that was like the beginning of, you know, actually turning snow into an idea. But it first hit me about six or seven years ago. And um, I don't know why. I don't know what it was that just excited me about it. But um, I drew everything out on a whiteboard. I might even have pictures of it still. And I was like, it's going to be called snow. Boom, 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 boom. And once I thought my business partner, he just didn't really like the idea that much, like as much as I did, I put it away. But, uh, you know, if I would have went with it at the time, who knows what would have happened? You know, I'm happy with where we're at regardless. But, you know, who knows? We Maybe we would have had a two-year head start if we, you know, if I would have went with my gut. Mm. So fast forward to now and now in the current times, like, 
how are things going? Have you guys been affected um, from from you know uh, online consumer purchases and and everything there? Like, talk to us about that. So the first seven to ten days, um, which was let's see here, March. I don't know, like March 10 through the 20th, let's call it. Um, March 10 through the 20th, uh, our conversion rate cut in half pretty much. Like people just were not buying. They were still visiting the website. We have about a million, million and a half shoppers a month. And so we were still around the same traffic numbers, but people just weren't buying. And so, you know, it kind of made sense. And I looked at myself and I was like, I'm over here, you know, uh, stocking up on food, stocking up on toilet paper and whatever, you know, just kind of herd mentality. And so everybody's in shock. Of course, they're they're not thinking, how wide are my teeth? They're thinking, how much toilet paper do I have? And, you know, that type of stuff. So uh, I was worried because I'm like, oh, my gosh, like if this lasts a long time, you know, we're really going to have to look at what we're going to do. Like, do we do we pause advertising? Like, I don't know. So. Yeah, we were affected the first seven to 10 days, like significantly, like cut in half or less. And then we started to look at, okay, what can we do authentically? Because our, our audience, you know, is 500,000 plus strong. Like they'll, they'll call us out whenever we do something that's not totally on brand, which is great. It's good to have that. Sometimes it's annoying because when you want to try something new, you know that they're already like, they're just waiting there. But, um, uh, yeah, we, we changed our messaging a little bit. We reminded people that, you know, we're still shipping. Um, we, we brought our spring cleaning sale 25% off. We brought it up to, you know, immediately. So 25% off site wide. We're donating uh, a percent of proceeds um, uh, to small businesses affected by COVID. Um, one of our team members brought up the idea about um, feeding America and that there are a lot of people without food. So we're changing uh, our organization next week to Feeding America. So we're going to give some money to Feeding America now. So we changed our verbiage. We said, you know, if you're going to be at home, you might as well be whitening your teeth. Come out of this smiling with the whitest smile you've ever had. We started pushing some of our other products like our anti-aging lip balm and lip scrub and floss. Um, and then that 25% off discount, giving the charity aspect, reminding people that we're an American company shipping from America. We're still in operation. We are a small business to uh, be patient with us. We're shipping as fast as we can order before we sell out. We don't know when we'll get inventory again. So there's some urgency there. And that some combination of that just clicked for us. And over the last five or six days, we've had, you know, incredible sales days. I mean, it's been, it's like, if, if not normal, it's better than normal, um, which has yeah. been really interesting. Interesting. So, um, do you have a, a an element of recurring revenue and subscription with the uh, with the whitening, with the, the the refills? We have so we just um, uh, we just launched toothpaste in pre order. So toothpaste will be a subscription product. Um, mouthwash will also be a subscription product, and then we just added subscriptions to all the products. Our customers they wanted to subscribe to the lip balm, the lip scrub, the floss. Um, and the refills, the refills, the, the average customer is refilling every three to six months, uh, uh, more so closer so. to the six month range. Yeah. Toothpaste yeah. is every two months up to four months. So every two to four months, they're restocking on that. Um, and the other products are in between. But yeah, there's there's a piece of it. By the end of this year, about half of our revenue will probably be coming from uh, recurring customers. Yeah. Um I think during times like this, recurring revenue is really, really important. What's what's your take yeah. on that for like e-com businesses and where they should be thinking right now around even that or any of the changing up the messaging or, or yeah. Oh man, I mean the thing is right now, there's a lot of uncertainty um, going on. You know, uncertainty around jobs, uncertainty around health, um, a lot. And so, the the more certainty you can provide on your website and in your ads, and the more you want to be sensitive to what's going on. You don't want to yeah, over hype it where it seems like you're doing too much. And you also don't want to be oblivious to it where it seems like you're insensitive. So I think being sensitive to what's going on, uh, if you're still shipping or if you're still in operation, let them know that. Uh, be very clear with what's going on. You don't have to send an email out like every 
5,000 companies have sent me emails. I don't really care. But um, you don't have to send an email about what you're doing in COVID, but it should be on your website very clear. We are still shipping, you know, through this madness or through these tough times. You know, we are here for you. You can call us. Like we, we opened up our phone lines. Like we put our phone number top right on the website. You know, we put our phone number in front of everyone live chat because we want to be there with the customers. And what we found is that they're very understanding. They're very like, wow, you guys answered. Like, you guys are working through this? Like, that's amazing. Like, I'm so proud of you guys. I'm like, oh, no, don't worry about it. If my ship shipment's late, it totally makes sense. Listen, you just stay safe. Like, they, we are banding together as a, as a, you know, the entire world is has banded together and said, it's okay, and our international customers are cool with it. So we've been changing our messaging around subscriptions because subscriptions, you know, profit cures all in a business and, and revenue cures all but profit most importantly and recurring subscription income is like the only thing you should be focusing on right now. Now, doesn't mean that every customer is going to do that uh, or be open to that. There is subscription fatigue. There's a such thing and your business, you know, I'm speaking generally, you know, uh, your business might not play well to subscription. Like my business is toothpaste and mouthwash. That makes a little more sense. Toothbrushes like, yeah, but some of our other products don't play as well. Like some of the other things we're doing just don't play well to subscription. That's okay. What you want to focus on though, that the premise is recurring uh, customers, you know, retaining the customers. So it's important more than ever for your email channels, your SMS channels, are you calling your customers? Even if you're B2B, are you picking up the phone, talking to your customers, to your clients? So this is the time where you really got to step up that point of communication uh, more than ever before. But I would be pushing, if you're in e-commerce and it makes sense for your business to have a subscription format, I would be, if you're running advertising, I would be running all that advertising to a subscription offer, 50% off your first month, 50% off your first year, whatever that looks like. Try to build the, uh, a Netflix or Amazon Prime in your business of some sort because times like this, is exactly why you want to have that de be able to depend on that income versus let me wake up today. Too many businesses are Facebook ad dependent and single product dependent or single offer dependent. Too many businesses. So if if I told you right now, hey, pause all your Facebook ads, would you go out of business or would you stay in business? Pause your Facebook ads for 90 days. If your sales will go to almost zero, you don't really have a business right now, and that's okay but you have an offer and you have an offer that's might be doing well on Facebook, but you've got to diversify. I don't care how small you are, how big you are, you've got to diversify and you've got to build recurring income. Otherwise you're in a, you're in a hustle business. You're not in a business business. Mm. Yeah, I agree 110%. So talk to me about kind of discretional costs. Have you cut back on influencer marketing? I'd love to talk about that. Like you've been pretty legendary on uh, you know the influences that you've worked with, and I think that's how, to be honest, I first heard of Snow um, was kind of you know some of the big celebrities that you've worked with. Uh, those kinds of things you were cutting back on, or Facebook ads, you know PPC. Are you getting more aggressive because costs are down by like thirty percent? Um, CPMs are at an all like you know like like really low now, so compared to you know three yeah, they months are. ago. So yeah, like um, are you going on the front foot or what? So uh, any of the discretionary stuff, so uh, influencers definitely have, we've pulled back on. Um, you know, we're looking at everything. I mean, this is a great opportunity, again, to detox. Look at every software expense, you know, no matter how big your company is. I mean, the bigger we get, the more of a reminder it is to look at every single expense. So down to the, the water bottles, you know, are we getting too fancy to the software? To It's a principle. You might only save five bucks or 50 bucks on the software, you know, by canceling. But if you're not using it, you're wasting that resource and wasteful spending is, you know, a practice you want to prohibit against as much as possible. And so we try to, as a team, look at in every department, which, well, how many, uh, how many pieces of software are you paying for every month? Or are you using it? When's the last time you used it? Could you live without it? Uh, influencers, you know, if anything's not driving bottom line, you know, right now we're cutting it or we're trying to cut it or we're putting it on pause. And then in terms of Facebook ads, 
you know, all ads across the board, Google, Snapchat, et cetera, have dropped about 30% for us, as high as 50%. So we are, as best as we can, tripling down. So, uh, yeah, we're we're pushing really, really hard. I mean, you know, April could be a 10 plus million dollar month uh, if CPCs stay the same, if they stay low enough, um, because we are getting much more bang for the buck. People are at home. They're on desktop, so if you're not opening up the desktop ads, open those up because people are on desktop more than ever right now. Like I said, I'm on this iMac. I'm on my huge desktop. I can open 20 tabs right here. So you want to hit me while I'm on the desktop because the conversion rate is so much higher on desktop, especially when you're selling a higher priced product, anything over 100 bucks. So um, we are tripling down on all advertising. We are using the time right now to push our message forward, get in front of as many people as possible, obviously convert as many into sales. But there's gonna, we're also building our retargeting pools. So you know, we're trying to get a million people to the website, only X thousand of them are gonna buy, but we're building that 60, 90 day retargeting pool, we're building our email list, so that when they feel ready to buy, because not everybody feels ready to buy right now, they're still kind of worried, they're not sure what's going on, but as soon as we run like a flash sale or as soon as, you know, they feel better in their position, we'll be there to, to convert them. So it's a great opportunity for you to build your email list, you know, put out content from your brand, uh, run contests and giveaways, uh, you know, all these things. So we're, we're like trying to triple down as hard as we can on all fronts in terms of advertising. And you should be in your business as long as it makes sense and you're making money you should be taking advantage of a, essentially a 30% discount right now. Yeah, no, that's an interesting take. Um, it's kind of like, you know, everyone knows Warren Buffett's uh, famous quote, be fearful when other, well, when, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. You know, stocks are the only thing people, stocks and a few things are the only things people run away from when they're on sale. You know, if a, a purse goes on sale, you're running to pick it up. If a stock goes on sale, you're scared of it. And so, I think right now is when a lot of a lot of opportunities out there. If you if you're looking at it the right way, I think uh, you know Post and Kellogg's. Kellogg's came ahead of Post cereal um, when Post cereal was the number one cereal brand. They pulled back on advertising. Kellogg's was an upstart. They stepped it up. They've never been able, Post has never been able to catch Kellogg's since then. Uh, Volkswagen and Toyota in the 70s, same thing. Toyota stepped up advertising. Volkswagen pulled back. Volkswagen has been chasing Toyota ever since. Uh, th there's a, an opportunity. You look at 2008, 2009, all of the amazing companies that were built in a downturn uh, or recession. There's opportunity there if you look at it the right way. But you've got to take things on a day-to-day -day basis. It's survival to fitness. It's Darwinism. It's You've got to evolve very quickly. Um, you've got to change your messaging. You've got to change your offer. You've got to be willing to discount things if that's going to get people over the edge. And right now you should be loading up, even if you're breaking even, but you're able to pay salaries or you're able to keep just stuff moving, you want to keep stuff moving. You know, unfortunately, like I went today to a, uh, a Vietnamese restaurant that we like, and he said sales, he was super happy. He was like, sales are about 35, 40% of what they normally are. So it's great. And in my head, I'm like, that sounds horrible. I was like, 35% of what they normally are. So 70%. Uh, discount on, on your daily sales numbers. But then I thought about it. I'm like, well, you know, first of all, restaurants, nobody's going to restaurants. It's just not happening. Um, he's not a big chain. So he doesn't have, you know, a lot of money to back him up. So the fact that he's able to make 35 to 40%, call it almost half of what he used to make with half of his expenses cut down because it's only him and one other guy running the restaurant right now. That means he can put food on, you know, his family's plate, he can pay his bills. He can keep the restaurant alive. He can pay rent because rent is still going to be due. So I'm like, that's amazing. Like the fact that you can still make 40% of what you do as a restaurant, that's awesome. So if he's happy, you should be happy with anything around there just so that you're, you stay in business. You can pay your employees if, if it's at all possible. Take advantage of the cheaper advertising. It's almost like you know, the Facebook gods dropped a little fairy dust down and said, for those who it applies to and who are fortunate to be in that position, here's an opportunity to get a discount while things are tough. Uh, and it's just supply and demand. That's just how it worked. But uh, my heart goes out to 
uh, uh, you know, millions of small businesses around the world who, you know, the average in America, small business has 26 days of savings. So 26 days go up, they're out, you know, and even if the government gives away, who cares how much money, like by the time the money comes in, the business is out of business. So if you are working online, if you have an online business, whether it's digital, business to business, business to consumer, whatever it might be, find yourself very lucky and, and strike while the iron is hot. The opportunity is in front of you. You've got to recognize it and you've got to strike on it because not everyone's as lucky as you. Yeah, I agree. It's it's very, very tricky. It's, it's a crazy time because you don't I know a lot of people would be self-conscious, right? They don't want to be seen like they're, you know, selling or, or you know, um, profiting or capitalizing off, uh, you know, all these people that are losing jobs and all these crazy things. What are your, what is your take on that? Yeah, so you want to be sensitive to it, right? But you, um, you know, you want to be, you want to be as, as take what you would normally do as a brand, um, and a brand is built by what you say no to versus what you say yes to. Like we had, you know, just a quick anecdote because this is part of brand building is, you know, we had the opportunity to launch charcoal, you know, charcoal toothpaste, charcoal this, charcoal that. Well, charcoal destroys the enamel over time. It's very bad for the teeth. And so we decided, although it could be a multi-million dollar channel for us of, or product line, um, we decided against it. We just And we still have not come out with charcoal toothpaste or charcoal whitener. We have a charcoal floss. Uh, in between teeth, but that's the furthest we'll go with that stuff. So, you know, you have to choose as a brand, what is your moral compass? You know, what is your ethical uh, compass to say what is right, what is wrong? What do I feel good about? Can I be proud of this two years from now if New York Times did a, sto a story on us about what we did during this time? Would you be proud or would you not be proud? And if you want to be proud and you have ethics and a, and a moral compass, you're going to use that to guide a lot of your actions and your ideas. So for us, you know, uh, you got to be, you got to keep selling. I mean, first and foremost, unless you're like, if you're selling a crappy product or service, or you're drop shipping and it's taking eight weeks now to get to people, like you shouldn't be selling, you know, that stuff. Like that's just have a have a common sense uh, meter in the sense of like. You know, am I doing right by the customer? You know, in a vacuum, would this be considered good or bad? Whatever it might be. But if you have a decent business, like let's say you're selling keyboards for computers or you're selling webcams or whatever it is you're selling, nutritional supplements, I don't know, digital products, if it is your obligation as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, to continue to drive value. If you're actually driving value for your customers, it is your obligation to stay in business and continue to do right by your customers. Open up the returns the, the, you know, we do free returns, free shipping. We're opening up a lot of those lines. I, I told the customer support team, look, if somebody orders and they feel bad afterwards and they just want a refund, there's no reason they just want a refund, just give them the refund. Because here's the thing, yeah, it's 120 bucks, but you know, right now 120 bucks means differently than it did three months ago. 120 bucks three months ago, it's like, ah, whatever, I'll make it back. Now it's like, if I'm not working 120 bucks, that's a week of food. You know, like, I don't know if I, I changed my mind. I really wanted snow because I saw Kardashian use it, but I changed my mind. So normally we would, we would have like a down sale. We'd be like, Hey, I understand you changed your mind. What if I told you, you could get, you know, we'll give you a $50 gift card or whatever it is. Now we're backing off and we're saying, look, if you change your mind, you want to refund, got it. Uh, we're doing the 25% off site wide so that we don't have to charge full retail for our product. Um, trying to listen to our customers, be understanding. The truth is people are at home right now and they want to wind their teeth. They want to feel more confident. They're hopping on zoom calls. They want to be able to feel comfortable with their smile. They want to have something of norm, uh, you know, of normalcy in their life while all this stuff is going on. It's something they can control. You can't go to the dentist here anyway, right now, none of the dentist offices are open. So if you're applying to get your teeth whitened, Sorry, it's not going to happen. You can't go to the dentist. Uh, you can't even go to the store to pick up strips. So, you know, we're trying to be there for our customers to help them feel more confident. That's part of our brand is to help people feel more confident. So the answer is like, if it's something that you are going to feel proud of, if it's something that you feel confident about, I can't answer that for everybody because you might not feel confident at all selling the products right now. You might not feel confident 
taking any money from people right now. You know, we opened up our payment plans, so it's 25% off, and then it's zero interest, zero uh, fees on the uh, payment plans. So it's literally like, I think it's like 28 bucks for four months for the full system, zero interest, zero fees, and you get the 25% off. So we're like going as above and beyond to meet the customer where they're at so that we can make it affordable if they really want the product. So it's 28 bucks instead of 150 bucks. So, you know, using Afterpay, Klarna, things like that, making, meeting your customer where they're at right now and putting that out there saying, hey, we're here for you. Here's, here's our payment plan. You know, here's 25% off. You don't have to go and, you know, give 75% off your brand and, you know, do that. But it just it shows that you're being like sensitive to what's going on and that customers will remember that they have pretty good memories uh, on both sides. You screw them over. You don't deliver on your promise. They remember if you go above and beyond, you give them a phone call, you check on them. They will remember that. Yeah, I, that was an awesome answer, man. Thank you. Um, I think that was spot on. Um, so talk to me about drop shipping versus brand. Because uh, I know you would see both sides of the table. Because um, you've been in, yeah, yeah, you've been in like online space. Sounds like for like fifteen plus years. So you you know that world. What is your take? Drop shipping versus building a brand. I think drop shipping just like so. I I started essentially building websites for other people. So I started kind of as an agency, and so that allowed me to find you know, my footing over time. And it took, you know, a long time. I started at 13 years old making my first website. By the time I sold a business, I was 21. So it was eight years. Um, It was a long time. And I'm talking, even though I was going to school at the time, you know, it was eight years of like, all I thought about was this stuff. Like I got great grades in school and stuff for my, for my family and all that. But, you know, it's eight years of obsession. Now, you know, I'm 27, tack on another six or seven years on top of that, um, which is just a different level of obsession of where I'm at now. Um, you know, drop shipping is, is great in the sense that it teaches you how to run advertising, teaches you how to write copy, teaches you how to do that stuff. That's awesome. I think that you have to you have to break away from that one way or another. Like, it, you know, obviously in, in Snow's business, since day one, we don't sell anything we haven't made from scratch. Um, you know, anything else out, out there that looks like us is a counterfeit. Send them my way. We'll take them down. Everything we've created is from scratch. Um, that's just something I've chosen to do. Um, I would do it again, even if I had to take a loan out, even if I had to put on credit cards. There's just something about shipping every product ourselves, touching every product ourselves, putting it in the package, seeing the name that's printed on the label. Um you know, there was a time where in the very beginning I was still shipping out. Now, here I am, multimillionaire, shipping out every package myself, driving to the post office 50 at a time. So mm-hmm. I was touching everything. I designed the first website, wrote the first copy, wrote the first ads in Ad Espresso, boom, boom, boom. I did everything myself. I called the customers myself on my cell phone. Like I did everything. But I did that because I it's a it's a principle. It's just what I do. It's like It's all I know. When I started my first business at 13, 14 years old, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was doing everything myself. I was programming. Oh, I need Photoshop. How do I learn Photoshop? Let me go to Google. How to learn Photoshop. Let me pick up a book. That's just all I know. All I know is how to get my hands dirty. Now, I've learned delegation and having a great team because you can only do so much yourself. Um, Nowadays, I spend most of my time on the phone and meetings, traveling to close deals. I spend time doing that. But I can still get my hands dirty. I can go and I can Shopify liquid develop. I can go write code. And I feel like too many people are afraid to do those things. They're like, ah, oh, I'm not a math person. Like, ah, oh, I'm not this. It's like, it's funny because everybody's a money person when the money comes around, but nobody wants to be a math person and nobody wants to be a programming person. And nobody wants, you got to be an everything person if you want to do it well and you want to be big and you want to be respected by your team. You have to kind of do it all. And, uh, you know, otherwise you've got to be so brilliant in whatever it is you do. You either got to bring a ton of money to the table where you can hire a huge team or you've got to literally be Albert Einstein or Elon Musk or I don't know. You know Elon Musk gets his hands dirty, so I can't even point to him. But, uh, yeah, I think that, you know, get, I think drop shipping versus brand building. Drop shipping is a great arena 
to learn things for sure. The problem is people get stuck there too often because I've learned in my life to chase difficulty. I chase the difficult things in my life. I thrive off of them because that's the only time I learn. If I take drop shipping, I'm learning a lot. I'm learning about logistics. I'm learning about customer support. Like I'm taking on a lot of it. So it's a great, great learning ground. I'm not knocking it at all. But to go from that to building a brand, which I think is one of the hardest things to do in business, like the Olympics of business, where you're printing every label, you're writing every ad, you're doing everything. Maybe you don't do it forever. You know, I did it for the first few months and then I started to build my team. But at least you can like, you can touch it, you can feel it. Like there were days where I could feel in my blood how much our sales were by the time I woke up. Like I could feel it. And I would, I would open Shopify and I'm like, oh, I was really close. I could feel when something bad was happening. Like it's weird, like you, you're so into it. I, I've worked with a lot of people and the ones who are like, I'm not a numbers person, I'm not a math person, I'm not this, I'm a nothing person. I'm a poor Hispanic kid that grew up with spit on my face. So like, I'm a nothing. So, you know, for me to be able to build, you know, a, a multi-million dollar empire from, from scratch and build an amazing team around that, I'm a nobody. So if I can figure that out, there's no excuse. So I think for me, sometimes I, you know, particularly younger people, including myself, I was victim of it. It's like, I want success tomorrow. Like I want to be a billionaire tomorrow. I want to be a millionaire tomorrow. You know, it's like this this need for now. Um, and so drop shipping gives you a little taste of that. It's dangerous stuff. Drop shipping is hunting rabbits. Building a brand is hunting elephants. Hunting rabbits, you can do it by yourself. It's very exciting. Rabbit, rabbit, rabbit. You feed yourself for the day. Great. Hunting an elephant requires skill. It requires strategy. It requires a team. But you can feed an entire village. And uh, that's a more powerful skill because less people are hunting elephants. Everybody's hunting rabbits. Um, and it's fun because you're running around, but you exert so much energy that you never can build up the fortitude to go after an elephant. Um, and people who hunt elephants don't want to hang out with people who hunt rabbits. It's just a different game. So you got to choose what you want in your life. I got tired of hunting rabbits. I got exhausted. I got really good at it, but I got exhausted. I got burnt out of doing that. And I was like, I don't care if I'm broke. I don't care if I never make a penny in my life. I want to hunt elephants. Like I want that side of it. Yeah, I love it, man. Yeah, look, yeah, it is. It is totally different, and I think yeah, that was a great um, breakdown. I, I share your your same uh, sentiments there. Um, talk to me around something that no one ever talks about, but I found interesting when we got connected uh, was around using Shopify versus having a funnel. And you said that uh, yeah, you you guys have funnels in place. Um, are we able to talk about that? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so so, so yeah, should people ahead. should people be using a Shopify store for their brand and running you know PPC to that cold traffic, retargeting traffic, whatever, or should they set up a funnel? Um, from my experience, a funnel converts way better for an e-com product or, or any product for that matter. Uh, running through a funnel, but a lot of e-com founders, they don't do that, man. They just go straight to Shopify. Like it, it, it kind of baffles you. I'm not really in that space. I know a little bit about it and I help my partner. She's got a really successful e-com business and I kind of come in on the side and, and help guide her. But like, yeah, it's crazy. Like talk to me about that, what your take is. Yeah. I mean, we've been guilty of it too. I mean, but it, unless you have a serious brand, like if you're Here's the thing, if you're Louis Vuitton, for, I remember for the longest time they had flash on their website, it wouldn't even load on my computer. Uh, if you're Louis Vuitton, they don't care about their website, they want you to come in store anyway. You're gonna, and look, if your wife is asking for that specific bag, trust me, you're gonna find it or you're gonna get a divorce. Like, you're gonna find the bag. So if, if you're Louis Vuitton, you can get away with that. If you're Joe's protein bars that just started on Shopify, I'm sorry, sir, but you've got to you've got to court me before I become your customer. So you walk up to a girl you like and you say, "Hey, let's go, let's go to bed." You know, she's like, well, "What do you think I am?" You know, like, and someone who says yes to that is probably not someone you want to you know keep in your customer list, aka get married to. So like, you want to court your potential customer. You want to hold her hand 
And think about sales since the beginning of time. It's like, you know, you come on and say, uh, hi, Nathan, are you looking for a car or a truck? Yeah, you know, I, I'm looking for, you know, actually a van. You know, my, my, my wife is, you know, uh, expecting, we're expecting our, you know, third child. That's amazing. Wow, you're expecting your third child. Wow, that's very, very awesome. You know, if it's a boy or a girl, oh, it's a girl. Wow, it's amazing. You know, I just had a, a baby girl last year, and I got to tell you, it's my first girl. And you're building rapport. You're building rapport. And then you say, hey, look, Nathan, come over here. I, I'm going to show you something. It just came on the lot. So you're building excitement. I've got your attention. Okay, now I'm building the interest. Come over here. Like, I want to show you something. Uh, okay, so this is my personal favorite minivan the reason why is every other minivan looks like a soccer mom car here's the truth she's saying she's probably telling you it's for me i'm going to be driving all the time there are times where you're going to have to drive that heck when she's you know you have to drive her to the hospital and you know god forbid she's delivering you're going to have to drive that thing well guess what you're going to pull into that hospital in style um this is amazing then you know you want to move into the next the next phase the desire of like uh, you know, AIDA is common formula, but you know, the desire of you being in here, it's like, honestly, this is a chick magnet. I know you're already with a chick. You're never going to cheat on your wife or anything, but I got to tell you, I drive this thing around on Sundays to go get coffee and stuff by myself. And I cannot, I don't know what it is about this design. You know, they, they hired someone from Aston Martin. So I think they put a lot of acid. It's like the Aston Martin of vans, I guess. So now I'm is a desire. So, and then action. If I could make this work for you, you know, how much are you looking to spend? How much did you tell your wife your budget was? Oh, I told her I wouldn't get something more than $600 a month. Okay, if I can make this Aston Martin Vans work for you for $600 a month, would you have a reason to say no? That's a funnel. What most e-commerce entrepreneurs are doing is you're coming onto the car lot and they're throwing you right into a van. You know, you're like, I wanted a car. I wanted a truck. What had you? I don't want a van. And they're slamming you into it. And then they retarget you with the same van that you don't even want. And you're like, why are you trying to throw me in this freaking van? I don't want a van. And eventually you wear them down. You spend all this money. Your CPA goes really high, cost per acquisition. And finally they say, all right, I'll give it a try. And they buy the van. Chargeback rates are high. Customer satisfaction is low. Nobody's coming back. A funnel allows us to take someone and say, Here's one weird trick to boost your confidence. Ooh, that sounds interesting. Then it talks about how your smile is your number one trait. And so that's an advertorial. So you can do this you know, for free. You can you literally just write something out, write a story. People like to hear stories. If you're selling you know, uh, you know, a, a book, you know, it's not about the book itself. You know, it's about what the book has done for people. So chapter three of this book literally made me a millionaire and uh and then you're like whoa chapter three of this book i gotta check out this book all right let me click that oh wow i can download chapter three specifically we're just putting in my email that's awesome i can tell a story so the funnel process is very important because it takes a cold traffic i mean think of our brand snow snow was seen by about 90 million uh people last year so our ads were seen by 90 million people out of that 90 million only about 10 million came and visited our website. Um, Shopify is not made to, to convert sales. It's made to accept sales. There's a difference. So you need to have something for whether it's click funnels, whatever the heck you want to use. Maybe it's just an advertorial. You can create a WordPress website or on Shopify's blog. It, on its, you can literally go inside of Shopify for it there, create a blog and put seven reasons why people are switching to blank put your your name of your brand and put the best seven things you can think of that i would care about as a stranger who doesn't even know who you are you know and 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 send the traffic to that versus sending them straight to your product page which is like throwing someone into a minivan who came in to buy a sports car and they're like oh, i don't even know what i want one of the best ways to do this which we found success with is quiz funnels uh so Taking them through a quiz, you know, do you drink wine? Do you drink coffee? You know, do you smoke? Do you brush your teeth? Are you in your 40s or in your 50s? Uh, we ask them, you know, 10, 15 different questions. And then we say, based off of this, here's what we recommend to you. We recommend the extra strength because you told us that you smoke and you drink red wine and you're in your 50s, you're going to benefit most from our extra strength package. And now all of a sudden there's 
a little bit of customization, even if you gave, even if you hacked it, and in the beginning you just gave everybody the same recommendation, you would have three times the conversion rate than just sending people to a page and then hoping that they buy. You have to take people to, you can't propose to strangers on the street. You gotta take them on a date first and a funnel, and funnels are the best ways to kind of take people through a date and allow you to tell your story and why you're different, prop up your price before you even show them what the price is. That's why you need that process. And I think we've, digital products have it, um, you know, info products have it, but I think e-commerce, it just has never been a big thing. And people are successful in spite of it. But now that Facebook costs are going up, all of a sudden people are saying, oh, what are funnels again? I think I need one of those. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Um, so, look, we have to work towards wrapping up, man. This is an awesome conversation. I could talk to you all day, brother, like just, just shooting it. Um, let's talk about influencers. I'd be, yeah, I, I think I'd be foolish not to ask you. Obviously, you've worked with which Kardashians? Uh, we've had, I'm trying to think of who's posted, Kim, Kylie, uh, trying to get the name, Chris, uh, I mean, we even had a uh, Caitlin post as well. So we've had, you know, all of them, I think, except Kendall um, and obviously Rob and, and, and that's it. And uh, Courtney, I think, posted. Um, so anyway, we've had, you know, pretty much the whole family uh, share our products. And, you know, as far as I know, they actually use our products, you know, which is really cool because that's a testament to the quality, you know, of, of what we built. When you work with these big celebrities, like a Kardashian or a Jenner, um, what are you looking for? Because I think when people look at influencer marketing and they've tried it and they say it doesn't work because they spent, let's just say, a couple of thousand dollars and they didn't get a return, is that what you're looking for? Or what is it that you're looking for when you work with these celebrities? What is the what is your intention? What is your goal? What is it that you see the bigger picture? Because I, I, I think I know what it is, but I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, you know, back in the in the early days, um, you know, you could pay an influencer. You know, TikTok is has it right now. Like TikTok, if you have the right offer, the right product, you could pay five hundred bucks for someone with a million followers, and you'd be a fool not to at least make some type of money back from that. So TikTok is is early enough that you can take advantage of some of them if you have the right product, the right offer. Um, Instagram used to be that way. It was like the heyday, and you had. You know all the 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 weight loss teas and the weight loss bands and all this stuff. It kind of it opened the way to kind of the more you know quote unquote slimier industries that are a little bit harder to get those customers to stand out. But it was working. You know people could sell a product for twenty bucks. You know make five bucks on the product and uh, you know get someone to promote it for five grand and they'd make ten grand on it. Like it was literally hand over fist. People were printing money. Well, you know as all things. You know, as it, as it always goes, supply demand. So what happened is that over the last four years, there's been a spike, and uh, bigger brands have been getting into influencer marketing. Everybody thinks they're an influencer, so there's been this kind of surge of like, I want to do this full time. And you know, I had one brand that paid me twenty thousand, Josh, so that's my price. And I'm like, well, you know, you you know, I would love to pay you twenty thousand dollars, but that's just not the market anymore. So um, because Instagram and Facebook have limited the reach of organic posts so much now, the value of an influencer is really around the content. So the way we look at influencer marketing now is you're either our customer, which is free to get you to post it. We just have to have some type of incentive there, um, you know, and make it cool. Uh, so free or you're a small influencer where we're paying 50 to maybe 500 bucks but we're really paying not because we're going to make money on the post. We're paying because we think you fit a look that we're going for to portray who's buying our products. Or, you know, we think you have an attribute that we think would stand out in an ad or it's content. So we're paying for content. And then everyone in the middle who we used to work with, you know, I spent millions of dollars in the middle, uh, they're out. So if you've got between one to 10 million followers, or even I would say 500,000 to 10 million followers on Instagram, we're probably not looking at you at all, unless you are nationally or internationally recognizable. So you might only have 3 million followers, but that's because you used to be the biggest TV star 20 years ago, but you still have appeal. Okay, maybe. But unless you're Nicki Minaj, 
or, you know, we've done work with like Ashley Benson. She's got 21 million followers. Like unless you're Ashley Benson, Nicki Minaj or Kardashian or you're, you know, one of our customers or you're someone with just a few thousand followers, everyone in between has gotten squeezed unless it's on YouTube because YouTube, the content lives on and on and on. So if you're like a fashion influencer or you're a makeup vlogger, then we might do some type of collaboration with you that makes sense and, you know, the content's going to live there forever. Okay, cool. But, you know, the day, the days of, you know, every influencer driving a Range Rover and just working from home and posting pictures, you know, with some tea, those days are long gone and they're not coming back. So, you know, I, I urge entrepreneurs to focus on follow the money. First of all, always follow the money. I don't care if it seems cool. You, you know, you know, someone who knows a celebrity and you want to become enamored with it. The reason why I'm successful in celebrity deals is I never get obsessed with any one deal. I'm willing to lose any deal at any time. I'm willing to wait. Okay. Nicki Minaj isn't ready for us. Okay. We'll talk in a year. Let me make sure she has product. Let me keep her updated along the way. We'll see what happens next. You know, it's like, Oh, so-and-so doesn't want to do a deal. Well, there's a hundred more. Oh, there's a hundred more. So I never get stuck to any one deal. And the, the, to answer your second part of your question is really around brand equity. So what I'm looking at is if I get this, the micro influencers, my customers to post, that's content. I can reuse that content on my website and my ads. You know, their sister might see it and want to buy it. It carries a lot of weight. Great. If a Kardashian posts or Nicki Minaj or Floyd Mayweather or Rob Gronkowski, if someone posts like that, I'm leveraging that in retail. So now a retailer, you know, or maybe you have like a small gym reselling your protein bars or you got, you know, the laundry mat down the road that you want to sell your products. You come in and say, hey, did you know a so-and-so Kardashian posted us? Check it out. All of a sudden they're like, come right in, sir. Wow. You want to speak with me? That's very nice of you. What can we do to work together? Oh my gosh. So, you know, you're leveraging it, but if you do not kid yourself and think that you're going to go and spend even a hundred thousand bucks on, I don't care who you have and that you're going to make the hundred thousand back. It's just not going to happen. Uh, it's not going to happen. If you use a coupon code, it's going to look very promotional. They're going to hate you for it. That let alone celebrities don't even want to post on their newsfeed anymore. They only want to do story posts which is crazy, 25,000 bucks for 24 hours on a story post that only 10% of our audience is gonna see. Forget it, take your money and go and spend it on Facebook ads where you can track every dollar it's profitable. Take it on Instagram, every dollar is profitable. Then once you have enough money coming through and if your goal is to be in retail or your goal is to have a globally recognized brand or household name and you have the money to do it and you're willing to lose it, then go and do that. But Really, right now, influencer marketing is just they're really expensive trophies um, for the most part. Yeah, no, I love your take around the brand equity and the content. Um, I think that's, that's yeah, really smart. And I think it really comes down, like you said, like with YouTube, um, you find, I don't know if you can comment, like I don't know if you have the same experience, but from my experience, uh, YouTubers seem to have a much deeper and stronger relationship with their audience so uh, it's not just about the follow account, it's the relationship that they have with their community and their fans. Oh yeah, I mean, it's the new TV. So, you know, when you, for example, Friends, you know, the TV show has been running forever and each of the cast members make 20 million a year just from the reruns. And uh, there's an affinity there. I mean, there's, there's a deep, deep, deep connection with someone you watch every single day, whether you're crying, whether you're lonely, you are sitting there and you you know that person. In your head, you're like, I know Kim Kardashian because I've watched her since I was eight years old. And it's like, no, you don't, you've never met her. It's like, I know her. Like, I know what she likes, I know how she is. And you see, you know, a large percentage of the population start to look like a Kardashian. I mean, from, and it may not be directly, but you see the eyebrows, they draw the trends. So TV, which is now YouTube, is very much in that similar fashion. People are obsessing over these vloggers, watching every single move, their mannerisms, they're buying their merchandise. So when you get in front of that audience and you get a stamp of approval from their leader, which is the vlogger that they choose to follow, um, and we have really like micro-nichified 
uh, TV watching. So if you're into hunting, but you're also somehow a vegan, you know, but you're also, you know, into makeup, but uh, you love Lamborghinis, you probably somehow can find a vlogger that matches all four of those random traits and you will say, that is my vlogger. That is my celebrity. That's who I follow. I'm going to go to all their shows. I'm going to buy all their merch. And if they tell me to buy snow, I'm going to buy snow because I, I trust this, this guy. I just trust him. So you want to find those high affinity points. But what I found now is with the larger celebrities, they don't have that touch because they're not talking to their audience. Every day. They're just posting pictures and it becomes superficial. The vloggers make you laugh. They make you cry. They make you nervous. That's the uh, ephemeral feelings. Like we want to go for that when we're trying to place our product, in, you know, into any type of video. So YouTube, if you're a YouTube influencer, you've got some time left, but you better be, you know, really strengthening that tie and figuring out what your angle is and growing your audience. Because I would love to talk to you if you have a very tuned-in audience. I would love to chat with you. I'd rather work with you and spend a little bit more money to have content that's going to live forever and be highly engaging that I could reuse as well than to get a 24-hour story post on someone that's never talked on video before to their audience. Yeah, I think that's spot on, man. Well, look, um, dude, we have to work towards wrapping up. Uh, two last questions. One, um, any just parting words of wisdom? This you've, you've shared so much gold. Like this is an incredible conversation. And then two, where's the best place uh, people can find out more about yourself and your work? For sure. Um, yeah, I would. I you know, like I mentioned it earlier, like chasing difficulty, um, adversity. You know, uh, sharpens diamonds. I mean, th- what's going on in the economy right now? It's an opportunity to take a step back, take a pause. Look at what you're doing. Look at what you have been doing. What has been working. Stick into your guns. Um, you know, look. If you have to shut something down, shut something down. I know it's painful, but you know, from the ashes you will rise. Like it, you know, I've I've had more. It's so cliche, but like I've had more failures than I've had successes. It's just true. That's just how it works. Um, you know, you have to be willing to make those hard decisions right now. You have to cut costs if you can keep selling double down on advertising if it makes sense for your business um you know stick to the core principles of what you're doing and then chase those difficulty difficult parts this is an opportunity right now to learn some difficult skills if it makes you uncomfortable as long as you're putting real effort behind it you focus on it you say i'm going to turn off my phone i'm going to block off distractions i've got two hours to take this course or to learn this i'm going to take notes i'm going to take it seriously and then i'm going to apply it you can learn media buying. You can learn this web design. You can learn, you know, packaging design. I knew nothing when I got started, um, and so I believe in you. I believe you can learn it. Now is a perfect example and opportunity to push yourself to go and learn those things. And maybe it's learning delegation, leadership, whatever it might be. So those are some parting words in terms of what's going on right now. The best place to find me is on Instagram at Josh Snow. And then uh, it, Snow is uh, on Instagram, just Snow, S-N-O-W. And then the website is trysnow.com, T-R-Y-S-N-O-W. Awesome. All right. Well, look, thank you so much for your time, man. If, as I said, you shared so much gold, like really just really insightful stuff. And I learned a lot myself personally. So thank you so much, man. Thank you. It's my pleasure. The founder mission is to help you create an ass-kicking business and help you learn straight from the mouths of world-class founders. Get your free printed edition of Founder Magazine featuring Sir Richard Branson. Just cover shipping and handling at founder.com forward slash Branson.